This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. I'm Peter Van Alphen, Chief Curator here at the ANS, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to Long Table 111. Uh, today's uh, host or speaker is John Thomason. Now, uh, we hired John about 18 months ago, if I remember correctly, uh, initially to run our eBay store. And very quickly, he uh, impressed us with his organizational skills as well as his numismatic knowledge. And we promoted him to deputy collections manager. Um, as of Monday next week, he will be the collections manager as our long serving and much beloved uh, collection manager, Elena Stolyarek, will be retiring. John will be uh, fully taking on the responsibilities of the collection manager. Um, <clears throat> as many of you know, he's also been contributing for most of this last year in the ANS magazine in the uh, new acquisitions column um, that we run in the magazine. And uh, today he's going to be uh, presenting some of these new acquisitions as well as some of his uh, vault favorites. So John, uh, turn it over to you. All right, thank you so much, Peter. Um, I'm really excited to be doing this long table, uh, I guess after 18 months plus. Uh, I couldn't get away with not doing one any longer, so they finally tapped me to do it. Uh, but now is a great time because we're nearing the end of this fiscal year, and uh, we have a lot of new acquisitions um, from the end of 21 through uh, date that um, we've highlighted in the magazine. And we will also be highlighting in the um, uh, uh, main area of the ANS. Um, so some of these items you'll be able to see in person uh, when visiting in the near future. Um, and uh, uh, but you know, in addition to that, um, for those who can't come in, this uh, this presentation will allow you to see some of these objects um, beyond just in print in the magazine. So without further ado. Uh, we'll start with the first object. Um, so this uh, is a set of NEO tokens um, that was donated by David Gladfelter. Uh, these came in uh, around October of 2021, I believe. Uh, this is a really impressive set of uh, material, um, just so everyone can see. This is what one of the books looks like. Um, it's actually a collection of over 3,200 tokens. Um, and they're Uniface aluminum tokens uh, it, that span 15 hardcover albums. Uh, these hardcover albums were actually arranged by David Gladfelter and uh, together with an inventory book, uh, they, they provide a really fascinating look into this sort of little known area of uh, US numismatics and tokens. Um, the set that we have is, is a pretty much near complete set. I think as near complete as one uh, can get uh, these days. Uh, if we want to switch to the uh, the uh, alternate view so we can get a look at this book here there we go um, so again this is one of the one of the hardcover books um, so uh, in it we can see that uh, there's a lot of handwritten notes and then the actual tokens arranged very nicely uh, by David uh, Dr. Jesse Kraft has been working through these uh, diligently, it's uh, again 3,200 tokens, so it's a lot to work through. Uh, again, these are all uniface, so on each page, uh, there's actually two sets of tokens. These would all be one side, and then on the other, uh, we've got the, a different set of coins actually, or tokens on that side. Um, so a little bit about uh, the these neo tokens. Uh, they the actual company that created these dies was called the Los Angeles Rubber Stamp Company. They were founded in 1884, um, and uh, throughout their, their time in existence, they had some location changes. They were always based in the LA area. They also had a name change in 1935 uh, to the LA Stamp and Stationery Company. Um, that uh, Lars Co., uh, they shuttered in 1964, um, and sometime after that, pretty shortly after that, a Neo Industries actually purchased uh, most of their holdings, uh, including equipment and the dies uh, that Lars Co. used to strike all these various tokens. Now, most of these are advertising tokens, um, if not almost exclusively advertising tokens. I'll see if I can get a close shot on one of these so you can get an idea. 
of uh, what they look like. Just move it manually here. So we can see here, uh, this is a, a token for the uh, Locker Club uh, Center of San Diego. Uh, most of these companies were in the, the California area, of course, um, this being a California-based company. Um, so when Aneo uh, Industries purchased their equipment, and again, included these dyes, um, and shortly after they purchased this material, they began producing trial strikes to sort of figure out what they had just bought, um, uh, because presumably Aneo did not strike tokens of any kind before purchasing this equipment. Uh, so after they had, had uh, produced some of these trial strikes, they decided to produce some collector sets. Um, they figured this was a good idea. They have this material already. So we think that uh, between approximately 22 and 35 sets were made. Um, and these sets actually contained essentially a, a full run, 3,500 tokens, give or take. Um, of course, the collector demand was non-existent really in the first place, and so and it remained low. And so the initial price of these, which I think was around $250, was dropped to around $150. Um, still didn't uh, see a lot of sales there. Um, and the the 22 to 35 sets that were created, that was it. They just they made those and, and moved on. Um, and to me, what's interesting about these sets uh, in general is that. Pretty early on, right from the from the beginning, um, these Aneo tokens uh, actually caused some consternation within the numismatic community. So, if you look back on uh, journals and um, uh, other publications from the time period, there were a lot of folks who were really upset about these Aneo tokens. Uh, and today, you know, some fifty uh, some odd years on. It seems a little funny to me that there was so much, um, again, consternation within the community. Uh, TAMS, the Token of Metal Society Journal, they rejected ads for the sets. Um, essentially, uh, part of the issue was determining what these were. Uh, were they, you know, uh, legitimate dial, uh, die trial pieces? Uh, were they uniface restrikes? Um, were they just outright fakes meant to, to fool the public? Uh, there was really no consensus as to what these were. Um, as of now, uh, they're essentially collectible in their own rights, and you know they're all struck in aluminum, they're all uniface. So now when they come up on the market, it's pretty uh, obvious from the get-go that these are Neo restrikes. Uh, they're not fooling anybody uh, as to whether or not they are um, LA rubber stamp company originals. These are definitely a Neo restrikes. And uh, again, they're fascinating. There's so many different designs uh, and types. I know it will probably take uh, uh, Jesse a long time <laughs> to get through all of these and accession them all, but he's working on it bit by bit. And uh, again, just a really interesting piece of numismatic history. And we really thank David for donating these and all his notes as well. Um, and just as a side note, uh, and EU Industries is actually still active today. They basically uh, more or less produce uh, parts for the aerospace industry, so they're not uh, making numismatic items anymore and upsetting any folks uh, with their restrikes. Uh, although I'd be curious as to know where the dyes are at this point. Um, so moving on, uh, we have a something radically different, which is a chamba rattle uh, or bell currency from Africa. So this one's. Uh, we'll give it a little shake so you can hear what it sounds like. There we go. Uh, so for any of you who know me, uh, I love this kind of material because it sort of straddles the world between, um, you know, what is what is sort of an art object uh, versus a uh, numismatic object. Um, and let's see if we can zoom out even a little bit. There we go. Um, so this piece was donated by uh, Alan Helms, who's donated quite a bit of um, African uh, tribal uh, material to us over the uh, last few years. Um, in this particular donation, there were actually three sets of, of iron bell um, or rattle currency. Uh, and these come from the Chamba peoples of Nigeria, or they're roughly located in, in modern Nigeria. Um, so with this particular piece, you know, the question is, is this numismatic or is this an instrument or both? Um, Roberto Ballerini, who uh, authored a book called The Perfect Form, 
on the track of African tribal currency, which in my opinion is, is probably the best book on these kind of you know large iron African currency pieces. Unfortunately, it's out of print and very expensive if you wish to purchase one, uh, as I found out uh, last year when I bought it from Roberto Ballerini directly, and he shipped it to me from Italy at uh, not, a, not a small cost. Uh, <laughs> but um, in his book, uh, when he classifies these, uh, he mentions that the main ring here, um, which in this particular example uh, is perfectly, you know, or almost perfectly round rather, um, but it can be circular, it can be ovoid. Uh, uh, when they're ovoid, they tend to be sort of squashed at the edges. Um, and he said they can also even be a square shape. And then as far as the, the bell attachments themselves, um, it, they can either be bell shaped or sort of dried tobacco leaf shaped. This is the bell shape. Um, and we, in the same donation from Alan Helms, there were uh, two examples that had the more tobacco leaf shaped uh, design for the bell. Obviously it does make uh, a noise, so I could easily see these being used as a musical instrument as well. And there are other African gong shaped currencies um, that fulfill, you know, can fulfill a dual purpose of being both a prestige item or a trade object and a musical instrument at the same time, which is, again is what makes this stuff sort of fascinating to me personally. Um, but uh, what's interesting, what I like about these pieces in particular is they're, they're clearly not one whole piece. It's a ring with smaller attachments. Um, and according to Ballerini, these could be spent both uh, all together uh, as a single uh, trade object or uh, ostensibly you could remove um, the, the bell shapes uh, or the tobacco leaf shapes and um, spend them individually. Although from what I have seen in the marketplace and elsewhere in other collections, I've not seen these individually. So it seems like for the majority of the time that they did remain together, but um, I'm sure there are specimens out there that uh, are singular and not attached to any given ring. And of course, even if they were separated, they could always be reattached um, for later. So moving on, uh, the next piece we have is a BAMS medal, British uh, Art Metal Society medal, and uh, if we can zoom in here. All right. Now this was an ANS purchase, um, and actually this and a number of other BAMS medals were sort of there was a delay. I think partly due to COVID, and partly due to some other factors uh, regarding production. Um, this piece uh, is by uh, Denuta Salowie. I'm sure I butchered that. Um, but uh, the piece is called Trust Your Instinct. Um, and on the obverse here, we can see we've got sort of 10 sublime looking faces. Uh, and interestingly, one eye is open down here. Uh, on the reverse, we essentially have a opposite view with 10 faces, all with their eyes open although it's unclear if the bottom face, uh, which would, I guess, either be here or here, but ideally here, it's, it's unclear if that eye is then closed, whereas the rest are open. Um, I'll be perfectly honest, before uh, I started at the ANS, I was not really familiar with art medals, um, but I've kind of grown to really appreciate them because, uh, you know, they're, they're small sculptures and um, they can be interpreted in a variety of ways. And my background being in English literature and linguistics, you know, I'm very interested in taking a text and analyzing it, interpreting it. And uh, to me, these are sort of like small poems. If, uh, if, if analyzing a, a large sculpture or painting uh, is akin to um, uh, dissecting a book, you know, a little metal like this is like dissecting a poem. Uh, so I had a lot of fun thinking about this piece, uh, especially because of the title, Trust Your Instinct, uh, sort of what does that mean here? Uh, all of these faces are closed um, as if they're just sort of trusting uh, their interior monologue, but you've got one with the eye open, uh, maybe not trusting their instinct so much uh, and looking, for, <laughs> looking out for potential dangers or hazards. Um, so, uh, and then on the... Uh, the, the reverse with the eyes open on the inside, this sort of speaks to me as maybe, uh, you know, having your, your eyes closed on the outside, but really having your mind open on the inside. 
uh, I don't know, I think there's a lot of fun interpretations here. So um, I'm actually looking forward to exploring the BAMS medals that we have in the collection more, uh, in addition to other art medals that we have, um, just because I think they're really neat pieces. And, and uh, you know, the one great thing about uh, being at the ANS, well, there's a lot of great things, but one great thing is that you've got this entire vault full of uh, innumerable objects that you've never even ran across or heard of before. And so for me, these art medals are one of those areas where, you know, they were completely unknown to me before, and now, uh, and now it's, it's a whole new area for me to explore. So I really, uh, I really like this piece. And uh, of course, I'm sure we'll be acquiring more BAMS medals in the future. Um, so we'll be on the lookout for those. So moving on to the next piece. Uh, we have a paper uh, dye trial. Uh, this was donated by uh, Life Fellow Mary Lannon, and we're all very familiar with Mary. She's a fixture here at the ANS, um, and Mary donated uh, quite a few things um, in addition to this um, this paper dye trial piece. Uh, so this is actually one of two paper dye trial pieces that Mary donated. Uh, the other. Uh, was a similarly sized piece of white paper uh, with uh, a 1983 JFK half dollar obverse. And it's actually struck twice on that, and, and one of them is sort of uh, almost cut out, actually. It's a little more fragile, which is why I chose this piece to look at, so uh, we didn't worry about uh, damaging the other one further. Um, but uh, this one is actually a 1983 um, uh, 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 reverse for a uh, the Los Angeles um, 24, I believe, 23, 24, 23, Olympiad dollar, um, uh, silver dollar. So we've got uh, the eagle uh, on the main part of the reverse here. And of course, it's backwards, so I can't read anything it says. Um, but uh, What's interesting about these uh, is I don't know if they were, and maybe Jesse and, and others may know the answer to this. Um, I'd be curious to know if these were struck by hand using the dies, uh, or if they were actually struck by machine. I mean, the papers, you know, it's paper thin. Um, so I would be interested to know if, if someone just took the dies and just stamped it, uh, or if they actually used the, um, uh, the machine to, to uh, create this piece, although I would think that it might destroy it if you used machine, but, uh, but maybe that's for uh, Jesse and others to figure out. Um, anyway, I do think it's a really neat piece, um, and I uh, wanted to highlight it here. I think this will be going in the display case. And actually, I guess what's nice about this is it's paper, and uh, so you can, I guess we were looking at the, <laughs> the backwards view there, but this is it facing forward, so we can see what it actually uh, looks like uh, correctly here. So. Got the eagle. So anyway, nice fun piece. Um, thank you, Mary, for donating this and for all the other donations you've made. Uh, moving on to the next piece, uh, we have, and again, my French is not so great, but we have an uh, EQ All 8L. Let me take this out of the box, actually. And so uh, this is, well, I'll just relay a little funny story. I was trying to figure out what the 8L was all about. I thought maybe it was an EQ of eight livre or something like that. Uh, but in reality, um, there's actually eight L's on the reverse. And I believe that's what the 8L actually refers to. Um, not so esoteric uh, as I thought originally. Um, so this was donated by uh, ANS adjunct curator, uh, Oliver Hoover. Uh, so thank you, Oliver, for donating this piece. Um, it was recovered from the Le Chamou uh, shipwreck off the coast of Nova Scotia in Canada. Um, I believe actually uh, our Eric P. Newman visiting scholar, Dr. Jerome Jambu, uh, mentioned this shipwreck in um, his July Money Talks, uh, which was titled The So-Called Pirate Coins from Myth to Reality. Um, but in this wreck, uh, which uh, the ship itself wrecked in 1725, the, the Le Chamou actually made many journeys from to and from France uh, to its fledging colony of Canada. Um, it was mostly ferrying equipment, supplies, um, passengers, I believe both military uh, passengers as well as non-military passengers. 
Um, and, uh, but uh, uh, in 1725, it sank right off the coast. It killed all 316 passengers. Um, and on this particular voyage, um, instead of just carrying uh, ordnance and passengers, uh, it happened to be carrying a large amount of gold and silver. Um, and these were possibly military payments. I think there's still some debate as to why it was carrying so much. Um, but uh, a, a large number of gold and silver coins have been recovered. Um, the wreck itself uh, was found, I believe, in 1965, and uh, it was uh, found by uh, Alex Storm and his partners, David uh, McEarkin, I believe, and Harvey McLeod uh, helped recover these pieces. So there were, uh, uh, to date, hundreds uh, of gold coins and thousands of silver coins that exist um, uh, from the Le Chamu wreck. And being that it was in the bottom of the ocean for a while and in and, and, uh, not so great a condition, it very clearly has, uh, you know, saltwater corrosion and other um, uh, indicators of it being in a harsh environment for a long time. But of course, you can still make out all the details um, uh, for being underwater for so long. Um, still a surprising amount of detail there. Um, so this is just a fun, another fun piece. I think what's interesting about uh, this shipwreck and this coin is that, you know, there's so much attention paid to U.S. Uh, uh, or Spanish ships and, and, and other uh, wrecks that are containing more, you know, American U.S. material. Um, I had never heard of this wreck before um, Oliver donated this piece. Um, and so it's just interesting that uh, despite the fair amount of coins that were um, discovered from this wreck that uh, I never heard of before, but I think that might be due to the fact that uh, in the U.S. a lot of what we hear about is just U.S. material when uh, it comes to shipwrecks and uh, Spanish material and the like. Um, so thank you again, Oliver, for that. Uh, moving right along, uh, we have a peace metal cliche. Uh, this was an ANS purchase. And this is really, really fascinating. Let's see if I can adjust this here. All right, there we go. Great. So um, this kind of cliche uh, is not, uh, I think cliche is often, uh, the term is used with uh, forgeries or counterfeits, but this is a different kind of cliche where essentially just uh, one or two small uh, thin, very thin pieces of metal are placed between um, the dies uh, to produce a uniface piece. Um, as we can see on the reverse here, um, it's uniface and we have an ink use design. Um, uh, and uh, on the uh, obverse here, or I guess technically it's a reverse design, we have Britannia handing a metal, a seat of Britannia uh, with line in the background handing a metal to a native chief. Um, so this design was actually never used on any British Indian peace medals. Um, it's a proposed design that was designed by Thomas Wyan, um, and it was meant to replace the sort of usual coat of arms reverse um, that uh, existed uh, heretofore on British uh, Indian peace medals. So if you look at your usual Indian peace medal, that's the kind of reverse that you will see. Um, so this design was, was proposed. Um, from what I understand, uh, the dies broke, uh, presumably after this cliche was struck because there's no evidence of die breaks on this piece. Um, but the die broke and there was sort of an, an immediate need for, for piece metals. And so the design itself was abandoned and the old reverse design was resumed. And this was just forgotten about, which is unfortunate because it's a really beautiful design um, as uh, evidenced by this cliche. Um, this has uh, essentially a proof finish um, in copper, and it's uh, likely unique. So it's a really, really fascinating piece. I'm really happy to have it in the collection, um, especially since the, no actual piece metals were struck with the design. This is sort of one of the few examples that exist out there, well, unique, at least as far as cliche is concerned. All right. For the next piece, uh, we have a um, Vladimir Zelensky medal. 
We'll adjust this again a little bit. This is a slightly bigger piece. So this was another uh, end of year, or sorry, um, uh, sort of, um, uh, I believe we purchased this uh, around uh, April, May of uh, 2022. Um, so it's a uh, bronze resin medal issued by the Jewish American Hall of Fame, um, obviously featuring Vladimir Zelensky on the obverse and on the reverse, we have the Ukrainian trident with um, the quote from Zelensky, the truth is that this is our land. Um, and what's really interesting about this piece is, uh, well, the sale benefited uh, victims of violence in Ukraine. Um, so that's an important thing to note. But also, uh, this is not your usual um, struck metal. This is made from, um, again, a bronze resin. Uh, sometimes this is called cold casted bronze, I think, um, but it is essentially, uh, you know, cast or printed. Um, it's actually very light. It looks big um, and it is a uh, large diameter, but it's not that heavy. Um, it's actually quite light. Um, but I think, I think we might see more pieces like this in the future, uh, especially when it comes to trying to turn something around rather quickly. Um, this was designed by um, uh, former U.S. Mint uh, sculptor engraver Jim uh, Licorettes and uh, which again, hopefully I said that right. Um, but uh, you know, in the time that it would normally take for someone to uh, design a piece and then have dies made and struck, uh, you know, there, there can be uh, quite a bit of time in between. So in order to get something out quicker, you know, there are new technologies that are emerging that allow uh, you know, metallic arts uh, to be produced faster. And especially with a piece like this, and this is why it's good to have this presentation here, we can see that this is a thicker uh, metal, um, something that would likely need to be cast anyway, uh, depending on um, the thickness of the relief here, which is quite thick. It's, it's inset into the metal, um, if you can see that. So, you know, it, it, to, to strike a piece like this may be difficult. Um, so casting it is the easier option. And of course, having it done in bronze, uh, this cold cast resin bronze, uh, makes it even quicker. So I, I, I know we have at least uh, one other metal um, in the collection that's of this uh, composition, and I would not be surprised if we see more in the future as you know technologies change uh, around making metals and coins and tokens. Um, so again, fun piece. This will also be on display in our uh, case um, once we change that out in about a week or so. It's right, so moving along. Uh, we have some hell money. So this is a term that some of you may have heard before. You may have seen some of this material before um, in various contexts, maybe walking through Chinatown somewhere, you know, uh, Chinatown, New York, Chinatown and other cities. Uh, this one's a really big piece, so I might have to go full extent here. There we go. Um, so this was donated by uh, John and Nancy Wilson. John and Nancy Wilson have uh, graciously donated quite a bit of material um, over the last year, and uh, they have some more material that's upcoming in the next magazine. Um, but this kind of hell money uh, is not actually money, of course, and uh, it's not even referring to the sort of Western or Abrahamic hell as we, uh, as most people know it. Um, this instead alludes to DU. Uh, I hope I'm saying that right, which is essentially land of the dead um, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Chinese mythology and folklore. Um, so uh, this type of quote unquote hell money uh, or DU money uh, is really a type of joss paper or incense paper that's meant to be burned. Um, so it's, it's not meant to exist um, on its own trade hands, etc. It's meant to be burned um, and it's burned in the context of certain uh, ancestor worship rituals. I don't pretend to know anything about the rituals itself or, um, you know, uh, how many notes are used, etc. But uh, I know that's the general context for uh, these type of hell notes. So this one in particular is just a rather large piece. In fact, I'm going to hold it up also um, so we can see sort of how big this one is. Um, and, you know, usually on these notes, you, you see different um, uh, different mythological figures, 
uh, on the obverse and reverse of the note with um, different valuations. Um, you know, this one has a, has a large quote unquote denomination. And there's a lot of features on it that make it seem like money, you know, sort of serial numbers and the like. Um, but again, the, the context here is that it's meant to be burned. It's not meant to be uh, money. Uh, it's not meant to fool anybody. Uh, it certainly shouldn't fool anybody. Um, I hope not anyway. Um, and they'll often say, you know, hell bank note on it um, to know so that you know exactly what it is, uh, which up here it says hell bank note. So anybody who has this should know exactly what that is. Um, now, in addition to a large collection of, of hell notes that were donated by John and Nancy Wilson, um, there was this one piece in particular, which I'll zoom in again, uh, I found really fascinating. I was actually really confused by this at first because it had what appeared to be, you know, Cyrillic uh, on it. I thought it was maybe Russian or, or Ukrainian or something to that effect. Um, but it's actually uh, a 19, circa 1951 Bulgarian 100 Leva note. And uh, what's really interesting about this piece is that um, a third of the note has been cut off. Uh, I believe on this, there should be another uh, third of the note that's, that's, that's missing. Um, and on top of that, there's a sort of Frankenstein-esque looking monster that's stamped over the portrait of um, Bulgarian communist politician Georgi Dimitrov. Um, and there's also a pig stamped over the emblem of the People's Republic of Bulgaria. But the reverse of this one is actually untouched, so it looks exactly as it should. Minus the fact that the third of the note is still missing, of course. Um, but I have uh, not a clue as to <laughs> why, what the context is here. Um, other than that, you know, this is a piece of hell money. Um, but why a, a legitimate uh, note was used, and in, as far as I can tell, this is a legitimate 100 Leva note. Uh, presumably, these could be purchased in such quantities um, that you could easily uh, cut them up and turn them into hell notes. Um, so I guess maybe this is just a, a, instead of having your own printed, you can just use these notes. Um, but the, the stamping is what's really confusing here because uh, again, we sort of have this Frankenstein-esque looking monster and the pig. So definitely uh, research opportunities here as to, um, as to uh, <laughs> who this is. I see in the notes, uh, the chat here that, uh, Someone noted that it looks like uh, the image looks like that of Lon Chaney um, in Phantom of the Opera. It very well could be right there, Daniel. Um, so anyway, just a really fun piece. There's a lot of Hell Notes in this collection uh, from John and Nancy Wilson. So uh, these are just two, two that I had picked out for the magazine, and um, I think they're just really fun. All right. Um, so the next piece that we have here is a large terracotta. Uh, sculpture, or I guess portrait, move this out, of Abraham Lincoln in profile. And of course, if you've ever seen a U.S. one cent coin uh, from the 20th century, this looks familiar. Um, so this is circa 1910. Um, it was donated by J. Eric Engstrom. Engstrom. Thank you uh, for this donation. Um, it's a really cool piece. Uh, it was uh, made by uh, Swedish-American sculptor Agnes Valberg Froman. Um, she was born in 1868 and uh, passed away in 1956. Um, she was born in Valder, Nazvik, Sweden. And uh, before coming to the U.S., um, uh, or that's where she lived, before coming to the U.S. Uh, to study and live, she mostly lived um, in, uh, in Illinois, uh, including the Chicago area. And in fact, she, she also attended the School of the Art Institute of Chicago um, in Chicago uh, from 1905 to 1903. Um, I'm sorry, that I have my notes here, 1903. It should be 1909. 1905 to 1909. And of course, with the Lincoln Cent coming out that same year, 1909, uh, Victor David Brenner's famous profile portrait, um, it would not be surprising if, um, if Agnes uh, Valberg Froman saw this new coin in circulation and decided to sculpt her own uh, uh, terracotta medallion um, using the uh, Victor David Brenner's design as um, her model. So um, on the reverse here, we just have her signature. Um, 
no date, but uh, based on when the U.S. Uh, when this scent came out uh, and when she graduated school um, from the uh, School of the Art Institute in Chicago, um, it's likely that 19, circa 1910 was once when she created this piece. All right. Uh, next, we have a Comitia Americana. medal and this was donated by anthony terranova thank you very much anthony zoom in here on this all right so uh regarding this this piece uh it's a 1777 committee americana horatio gates medal and it's in silver plate of bronze uh now there was some speculation um, that this might have been a silver uh, original example, um, but we did a specific gravity test or a specific gravity test was conducted um, and it showed that it was not uh, in silver, um, but likely uh, silver plated bronze uh, or something similar. Um, if it were uh, an original example in silver, of course, it would be an important discovery piece. Um, because uh, there are only three known originals in silver. Two are held uh, by institutions. One is in private hands. Um, that being said, uh, if this is indeed a, an original in silver plated bronze, then it too uh, might be unique. Uh, it appears to be unique at any rate, um, and therefore still very ripe for research. Uh, I, I spoke with Dr. Jesse Kraft about this piece before I um, uh, before I wrote about it in the art, uh, the magazine, and uh, he pointed me towards the uh, uh, John W. Adams collection and the catalog produced for that, um, where I gleaned a lot of this information. And in that collection, uh, there were no silver-plated examples of the Horatio Gates medal, so um, this could be very well could be a unique specimen. Um, and either way, it's a fantastic piece of early American medallic art. Um, and uh, we're really happy that, um, that Anthony Terranova decided to donate it to us. Um, of course, I think we, uh, it would be nice to have an example in silver, but uh, it's, it's just as nice to have something else that's unique, um, uh, perhaps even better. So uh, again, thank you for donating this. And uh, of course, if anybody would like to research this piece further, just get in touch with us and Jesse. All right, moving along. Uh, we have a ANS membership medal. This is one of two ANS objects that I'll be showing today. And this is an ANS membership medal that was donated by Dr. Ira Rizak. Thank you, Ira, for donating this piece. Um, what's really uh, fun about this membership medal is a 1910 membership uh, medal and it has an error on the reverse. Um, the obverse here is perfectly fine, but on the reverse, uh, the ANS motto, Parwa ne Pereant, is uh, transcribed as Parwa ne Pereant. Um, and of course, uh, Parwa ne Pereant roughly translate to, you know, uh, let, uh, let not the small things perish. Um, I was hoping that Parwa ne Perant translated into something maybe kind of funny. When I threw it into Google Translate from Latin to English, it gave me, let the small things perish. Um, I don't think that's quite the case. Uh, Perant, I believe, is a, a valid um, conjugation, uh, uh, but I believe Perant is in the subjunctive. I think Perant is in the indicative. And when I threw it in Google, uh, I think it just didn't know how to translate it because ne, I believe, normally is only used with uh, the subjunctive um, and therefore didn't know how to render it. So it rendered it, rendered it as let the small things perish. But in any case, it's just probably bad Latin more than anything, um, uh, more than anything funny. Uh, thankfully, this uh, piece was not issued uh, to any ANS members in 1910. The error was caught before it was issued. Uh, Scott Miller probably knows more about uh, this, of course, than I do. Um, but uh, I, th I believe as far as we can tell, we, we haven't seen any examples with a member's name inscribed uh, anywhere. So that would suggest that uh, none made it out and were issued. 
Uh, but surprisingly, we did not have this piece in the collection, and Ira noted that. And uh, and again, thank you, Ira, for for finding that and donating it to us. Um, so we have this fun error uh, in our collection, and uh, I'm glad it was not issued to anybody. It'd be a little embarrassing to have our logo incorrect on our own membership medal, of course. Um, so. Uh, what I'm going to move on to next uh, in these last 20 minutes um, are some items that uh, have not been published in the magazine yet. So these are upcoming for the magazine. And of course, these are also items that I would like to um, put into the display case for folks to see when they come in. Um, so the first uh, are two more ANS objects. Uh, and these are really, really important and really, really happy to show these to everybody. Um, these are two Saltus Awards. Um, let me zoom out here so we can see both. So this was a combination purchase and donation um, from Chris Wyman. Uh, Chris Wyman is the grandson of Adolf A. Wyman and the son of Robert Wyman, uh, two very, very well-known and famous U.S. medallic artists um, who have produced a lot of work in their lifetimes. Uh, so this uh, Saltus Award medal here on my left uh, is the one that's actually awarded to his grandfather, Adolf A. Weinman. And on the edge here, we can see uh, Adolf Alexander Weinman, 1920. So this is his ANS Saltus Award medal. And on the reverse of the other piece, we can see that uh, it is inscribed to Robert A. Weinman, 1964, from when this award was issued to Chris's father. Um, this is a really generous, um, uh, uh, again, purchase donation. Uh, we, we essentially purchased some material from Chris, and he also donated some pieces. Um, and we're really, really happy to have them here at the ANS. It's a perfect home for them, of course, because these are ANS medals issued. Um, uh, to his family uh, and to have them remain together along with the other material that we purchased uh, and that Chris donated, uh, to have all that remain together and not be broken up and stay at the society for uh, continued research and for, for generations to enjoy to come is really important and uh, we're extremely happy to have them here. So thank you, Chris, for working with us to make that a reality. Um, those are you know, just amazing pieces to have. Uh, it's sort of like they're coming home in some sense. Um, uh, so again, uh, be on the lookout for these in the magazine, uh, along with some other items from that purchase and donation group. All right. And for the next one, we have a very recent purchase. Um, this is the International Numismatic Congress 2022 official medal. So we just purchased these uh, prior to uh, most of the, uh, or a good chunk of the ANS staff traveling to Poland, including myself, uh, for the International Numismatic Congress. Um, and so we purchased one in uh, silver plate of bronze and in silver. I did not know this at the time, and I don't think anyone did, but uh, they actually look more or less identical. Um, the, the bronze piece uh, is silver plate of bronze with select gilding. And of course, the silver is silver with select gilding. So at first glance, you wouldn't know the difference. This is actually the silver version. Um, and on the, uh, oh no, I, I'm sorry, take that back. This is the bronze version. Uh, I thought it pulled out the silver. Um, but uh, suffice it to say, the silver and the bronze look more or less identical. The weight's a little different, uh, but that's about it. Uh, so this piece, I actually thought that this was the obverse. Uh, but when I was quickly looking on the Polish Mint website and the International Numismatic Congress page for this medal, this is actually the reverse, I found out, or at least that's what they're calling the reverse. So this is actually the obverse. Um, so again, this is produced by the Polish Mints. Uh, the, the silver version is 92.5% silver, um, as opposed to the usual sort of 999 fine. Um, 
the on the reverse uh, or sorry obverse here uh, there's uh, remnants of uh, the Royal Castle in Warsaw in the background. We've got the International Numismatic Congress logo um, for the 2022 conference there in the center. And then on the bottom, one of my favorite things, coins on coins, coins on medals. I love uh, any sort of meta thing. Um, so this has quite a few meta items on here. Uh, from uh, left to right here, we've got a Krakow Groschen of Casimir III the Great, I believe the only Polish uh, monarch to be classified as the Great. Um, we have a Glogau Groschen of Sigamundus I the Old. And again, sorry if I'm butchering these names. Uh, we have a 100 Polish Zwati from 1925 that's gilt, uh, a 10 ducats of Sigamundus III Vasa uh, from Riga, also in gilt. This one, which you'll notice mirrors the, um, the little bird, which potentially may be a peacock here, um, is a uh, Princess Poloniae Denar or Denarius uh, from Boleslav uh, Chobri, which uh, I think is um, Boleslav first, the brave. Um, and uh, the very last one, uh, actually, I think they didn't mention what this one was. It might be the reverse of the same, uh, the same uh, Danar actually. This piece um, and what the what the logo is uh, derived from. I was hoping that we'd have one in the collection. Turns out it's a very rare, very scarce coin. It is essentially, uh, from what I can tell, the first true coinage of Poland, um, issued in the uh, 10th century. Uh, we do have a number of very very early Polish coinage um, from. Uh, the 11th century and beyond. Um, this particular piece, though, we do not have, although I was able to see one in person uh, while we were in Warsaw, so that was fascinating to see. I guess it might be the last time that I see one for a while because uh, they're so scarce. Um, and on the, what I thought was the obverse, but is actually the reverse, uh, we have a stylized uh, set of hands holding a, a gilt uh, 100 ducats of Sigamundus III Vasa issued in 1621, which I believe should be the same coin type uh, as this. This must be the reverse or maybe a similar coin. Um, it's a really fun medal. Uh, again, I love anything meta, anything with coins on coins, coins on medals, medals on medals, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, again, expect this to be in the next magazine article, hopefully with more information about the coins that are depicted. Uh, as I do a little bit more research on this piece. And in the same vein, we have this little guy. So this was um, something that the, uh, I believe the Polish numismatic, uh, a Polish numismatic group um, had made available at the Congress. I actually struck this myself uh, using a little setup they had. Uh, so I had a, uh, a hammer that they gave me, and uh, they inserted the the blank um, planchet, and I struck it as hard as I could uh, without missing the die uh, or the dies rather, and uh, struck this fun piece. So again, we've got this little just a little aluminum token. Um, of course, I had to buy two: one for myself and one to donate to the society. So this is the one I donated. Um, but uh, as we can see here. Hopefully I can get the light a little bit better. We've got the same logo um, for the International Numismatic Congress in 2022 uh, with the bird. Um, and again, I sort of mentioned this earlier with the uh, metal, but um, there's speculation that this is, in fact, some sort of peacock as opposed to just kind of looks like a chicken to me. But uh, I think it's a, folks have said it's a peacock. And with the tail feathers, I guess that makes sense. I don't know if peacocks made it all the way to Poland. Um, in the uh, 10th century AD, but maybe they did. Um, and then on the reverse, it's sort of a simple, just 2022 Warsaw, Poland. Um, it was, if anything, it was just more fun to strike this. Uh, <laughs> so, and, and of course it's given me ideas about having a similar setup at the ANS and uh, making dies for folks to strike their own tokens when they come in. So hopefully that's something I can make a reality in the future. Um, all right, so we've got about uh, 13 minutes left. I've got just um, uh, 
two more pieces. So we're right on time here. All right, so this one we won't need the camera, the small camera for, but uh, we've got this large throwing knife. Um, and this was also donated by Alan Helms, who donated the Chamba uh, currency piece uh, or Chamba rattles. Um, and these, these throwing knives, uh, again, whether it's money, whether it's a prestige piece, whether it's a trade object, you know, there's a lot of speculation about what these could be. Um, and in some sense, they could be both. Uh, they could be a musical instrument and a trade object. They could be a weapon and a trade object. Now, I haven't yet attempted to throw this knife, and uh, I don't think uh, Peter and others would like it if I did, but um, uh, I, I'd be interested to know if this actually works as a throwing knife. Um, on the bottom here, uh, I often see that these are wrapped uh, still in leather or, or um, cloth or some sort of rope or cord. Um, this one does not have any sort of uh, wrapping on it, um, which indicates that it's probably more of a prestige piece or a trade object uh, than it is a functioning throwing knife. I mean, I still wouldn't want to be attacked by this thing, of course, uh, with by somebody wielding it. Um, but another indicator that this is maybe more of a prestige object uh, is that it does have design elements on it. And I don't know if we're able to zoom in on that there. Uh, maybe not. Uh, so I'll put it under under this other camera here. But, you know, on a, uh, not, not that, you know, swords and, and, and knives and other objects, of course, uh, throughout uh, time uh, have been decorated. So just by virtue of being decorated uh, does not mean that it's not a real weapon or object. But in the context of these kinds of throwing knives, the ones that were that were authentically used as weapons or hunting weapons or or something uh, similar, I think they tend not to be uh, in size with any designs. Um, this one, you know, throughout the the whole of one side has uh, quite a few design elements incised into it. That sort of says to me that this is maybe more of a prestige object, trade object, uh, and therefore more like money uh, than uh, like a weapon, but um, you know, again, this is this is where researching this uh, is crucial. There's a lot of um, a lot more work to be done when it comes to understanding how these functioned um, within various societies and groups in Africa, um, and how they were potentially used as money, or at least to help facilitate the trade or, or purchase of um, livestock and. Uh, and other uh, important items, um, not necessarily day-to-day -day transactions, of course. Um, but I really like this one. Um, uh, what's interesting to note too about these pieces is that there are actually quite a few um, uh, uh, groups that that have different various throwing knives and uh, throwing knife, you know, quote unquote, money throughout um, West Africa and Central Africa. So this is just one of many designs. Uh, this particular type is called a, a, a Sengiz or Sengizi, and it's from the Mafa or Matakam, and they're in northern Cameroon and Nigeria. Um, so just a fun, fun piece. Um, and last but not least, um, so that we leave uh, at least a few minutes for questions, uh, we have this um, counterfeit, uh, and actually let me remove this as well, this counterfeit uh, half penny uh, dated uh, 1699. Um, this, along with 95 others, uh, were donated just the other day by Ellen Overton. Um, these were actually uh, excavated from the uh, building of the I-95 Expressway in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. And um, these were found by metal detectorists. Uh, I'm sure they had a field day when they were given permission to do this. And they were, uh, I think, for the most part, given permission to um, to detect while the expressway was being built. And all kinds of objects have been found, um, I know, including um, an African Manila currency piece uh, bracelet, um, uh, if not, uh, I believe at least one, but maybe even more. Uh, I believe uh, Jesse Kraft knows a little bit more about that. Um, but this, uh, this piece here, uh, these actual, the, the, authentic versions of, of these uh, William III half pennies, uh, which are British, uh, the legitimate ones are, are, I believe, are quite rare, um, or at least certainly scarce. Um, and so many of these fakes 
uh, were, were brought over. I believe most of them were, were likely made in Britain and then brought over to the US um, that they essentially you know, just flooded the market. There were just a, so many of these contemporary counterfeits that were circulating. They're all dated, uh, at least these ones were all dated um, 1699. Um, they're obviously not in great shape because they were um, uh, metal detecting fines. Um, but uh, uh, the next step with these really is, is figuring out how to remove them from the board. They were mounted, uh, unfortunately, onto um, a board, which, you know, is, I'm sure a common enough practice for folks uh, at the time who were digging these up as an easy way to display them. Um, so the next step is to figure out how to remove the adhesive safely um, so that these can be conserved and, um, and studied further in the future. Uh, this one in particular was actually already loose. So this one, I guess, just was not glued very well. Um, these pretty much all have the obverse showing um, on the board. And so whatever adhesive existed on the reverse here, there's not too much left. Uh, not You can see with the naked eye anyway. Um, so again, another piece for the magazine. And uh, that wraps it up. That concludes everything. Um, so thank you very much for allowing me to go through some of these uh, new acquisitions. Uh, th there are so many more that I, I, I could have easily pulled out and spoken about, but we don't have you know, three or four hours to talk about all these coins. So if, I, if, I, uh, if you were a donor and I, I missed it, it's not because uh, I didn't find it to be a favorite, it's just because of time constraints alone. So hopefully we can, um, we can uh, open it up for questions in the last few minutes here. I just want to say thank you, John. This is a lot of fun and remind folks that um, in two weeks, we're going to be having our annual meeting and there will be a small display of many objects that were talked about today, um, just kind of highlights from recent acquisitions um, over the last year, our last fiscal year at the ANS. Um, I also just, this is not really a question, but um, I love the, um, the error coin for membership. Um, you know, the, in the year 2022 uh, for membership and kind of output by what textual output by the ANS is we're at an all time high in some ways. So I love to remind Emma and the team of this particular, I, I only knew about the, the silver one from Scott Miller's book and the, the one in the ANS collection, um, the Borglum, uh, Borglum uh, looking from behind uh, member metal, um, but the error strike saying you know, per ant. Um, so uh, when, when, you know, when I, when I have a, a typo or Emma has a typo, I love to say, look, we're not striking silver, you know, we're, we're just, we're just, you know, we're, we can change, you know, something on the website. So that's, um, it, I love to see that, you know, they were writing three words on their public thing and got them, got them wrong. So we, well, can, and we have we the could, benefit. We could put out 700 in a week and, you know, and it, and miss a miss a period and we'll be yeah. okay and we have the benefit of spell track in 2022 they did not <laughs> also true also true but then they had their i mean because they're i mean we have a silver and a bronze example so so you know we at the very least there were multiple times that this was struck and <laughs> i'm gonna check this yeah chat, like hmm, should have to be a fly on the wall uh, um, thank you john that was great no no very welcome um yeah, if there are any questions, specific questions, uh, I don't know if I can necessarily answer them since I don't have the uh, numismatic chops that our curators do, but um, uh, if there are any, I'm happy to answer what I can. I see that there's some questions in the chat or uh, some notes in the chat uh, regarding um, the Bulgarian note uh, from uh, Adam uh, Philippides about uh, the pig may being a political statement. Very could easily see that being the case. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, yeah, I think that's more or less it. Yeah, I actually was not aware of the silver specimen in the collection, so that's good to know that we now have the silver and the bronze of the, uh, the error. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.